I've never tried one of these, but I've heard really, really good things about them. And that looks like it is at peak ripeness there. Let's see if we can get it off of there. What's up, Lazy Dog fam? I hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. It's time. It's sweet tater time. On that last video, we got our plot ready behind me here. Got our three rows kind of laid off where we're going to be planting each of these three varieties. Got our sweet potato slips from Steel Plant Company sitting in a jar of water for a few days. They're nice and perked up, ready to go in the ground. So we're going to plant sweet potatoes. Then we're going to check on some of our indeterminate tomatoes. I saw a couple yesterday that looked like they were at peak ripeness. So we're going to see if we can find one or two and give them a try. So if you missed that last video, this is where we're going to be putting our sweet taters this year. We thought about raking that straw out of there. We had that straw around our garlic. But then we thought, well, it might be easier just to make us some lanes there. Just rake back that straw. And so this is quite different than how I usually plant sweet taters. But I think it will still work. So we have three lanes there we can work with. And we'll still be able to heal the sweet taters once they get up and going a little bit. Then we can put that straw around them and uh, kind of close the gaps a little bit. But before we plant those, let's talk about growing sweet taters a little bit. So sweet taters are one of the few things that we can grow down here throughout the entire summer. They love the heat. They do fine in the heat. They seem to thrive in the heat. They're not that thirsty compared to a lot of the things we grow. We will give them a little splash with the overhead sprinkler from time to time. They don't need a lot of water compared to other things we grow and they provide a really good ground cover. So it almost doubles as a cover crop. Great thing to have in your garden in the middle of summer, especially if you live in the south where it's kind of hard to grow anything else on those, you know, mid 90 days. Now, unlike regular taters where we're putting the spud in the ground or the tater in the ground, with sweet taters, we're putting plants in the ground. And there's two different types that you'll see people plant. You'll see people plant what they call slips. That's what these are. You'll see people plant what they call draws. And I prefer slips over draws, but I'll tell you the difference. So this is a slip. And how do we get this? But what they do is they put a bunch of sweet taters in this big bed of soil, just a little bit of soil on top of them. They're not putting them in there real deep. And what happens is those sweet taters will start sprouting. They'll form sprouts all over each sweet tater there. So these will kind of grow out from that soil. And then they just go through there once they get a good size like this and pluck them off. So they'll have roots on the bottom here from that soil, that little bit of soil they were in. And we've got a nice little plant or slip here. Now a draw is taken from the actual plant. So imagine once you've got your sweet taters up and growing, you've got vines going everywhere. You basically go just pluck a piece of that vine off and plant it. That's a draw. So the draws typically don't have any roots on them yet, whereas the slips do have some roots on them. And like I said, I like slips over draws. They just seem to take better in the soil, seem to take off better, have a higher survival rate with the slips than I do the draws. Now I have heard of people doing this. If you live in the South where you have a long warm season, they'll plant slips. Once the plants get up and going, then they'll take draws off those plants, plant them another round of sweet taters. So they almost have like a succession plant of sweet taters. I've never tried that. I might try it this year if we have an open space. It'd be worth a try. A nice way to kind of double your money on the slips you purchase. But, uh, you know, that's one way to do it if you've got a long growing season. These things typically take around 100 days. So you can grow them up north. You just got to time it a little better if you're doing it up north than down here. You need 100 good days of warm weather to grow out sweet taters. Now, obviously, you can grow these in the ground like we're going to do here. You could also grow them in a raised bed. Just know that the vines may kind of climb down the raised bed and sprawl a little bit, kind of like pumpkins or watermelons might do. But your sweet taters are going to stay within the raised bed there. You'll just have foliage kind of climbing everywhere. You could also grow these in a container as long as the container was isolated somewhat and you didn't have vines climbing all over your other containers. So if you kind of space your containers out a little bit, 
plant one of these in a container your sweet taters will be right there but yeah you're going to have vines kind of all around that container so we're growing three different varieties this year we're growing georgia jet puerto rico and orleans now the georgia jet is one that we grow every single year i really like it i've grown a bunch of different types i've grown covington centennial beauregard georgia jet vardaman i can't even remember how many different types of sweet taters i've grown but georgia jet always outperforms the others for us at least down here so we always plant georgia jet the bunch puerto rico we grew those last year like those pretty good and then the orleans is one i've never tried so we'll see how it does now usually the way we plant these is i take the tiller and wherever my row is going to be i just till me a lane right there where we're going to plant those sweet potato slips maybe go through it a couple times fluff up that soil really good and then we just kind of poke those slips in the ground we used a stick to do it last year instead of bending down and that worked really well but you got to have the soil fluffed up good for that to work since we're planting in the no-till plot this year we're going to have to do it a little different so this is not as fluffy as it would be if we came in here and tilled it but it's pretty soft there's a good bit of compost down there and so we've got some nice kind of light airy soil which is going to be good for growing sweet taters so since we're not going to till this what we are going to do is we're going to take the wheel hoe make us a furrow put us a little pre-plant fertilizer in there and then lay those slips down in that furrow and because this soil here is pretty nice and soft i think everything will go pretty well now for the pre-plant fertilizer we're going to use we have several different options as far as those nature safe fertilizers we use as pre-plant fertilizers we've got a 1300 we've got an 855 and then we got a 10 to 8. Well, sweet taters can benefit from some extra potassium. You don't want to just give them all nitrogen. So we're definitely not going to use that 1300. And I think between the 855 and the 10 to 8, that the 10 to 8 would be better for sweet taters because of that extra potassium. So that's what we're going to use to put in the furrow. Let me go grab the wheel hoe and we'll get them laid off. All right, not the straightest rows I've ever made, but they'll work. And if it looked like I was bearing down real hard on that plow, it's cause I was. I was trying to go a little bit deeper than normal with it to get down to where that kind of native moist soil layer is. So we can put those sweet tater slips, put those roots in contact with that moisture source there, as opposed to them being in that compost layer, which tends to stay kind of dry. That also allows to plant them a little deeper which is always a good thing when planting sweet taters. And since we're planting several different varieties here, I always like to plant them in alphabetical order. That way I can remember what I planted where. So we'll get Georgia Jets right here. We'll get Orleans right here. We'll get Puerto Rico right there. So we got our Georgia Jet slips right here. They look pretty good. That's that stuff they put in there for kind of moisture retention during shipping. Seems to keep them relatively healthy. Always helps soak them in water for a few days. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can, almost like you're planting a tomato plant, make you a little hole right here and stick them straight down. The way I like to do it, the way I've been doing it the last few years, is to kind of lay them in the furrow. That way we get kind of more of a strand of sweet taters come harvest time. So we just lay it down in there like that put a good bit of soil around it and make it so they're standing up like that but our root is laying horizontal like that as far as the spacing goes on these I like to put them about a foot apart so when we're laying them down like this it's almost like they're planted end to end so we'll do the same thing with this one we'll lay it down there cover it up plenty of soil situate it just like that and so they end up being about a foot apart there get one more in here lay it down soil on top just like that all right all right all right we got them in there now a couple of these rows i think these first two rows we didn't make it quite all the way to the end i think those bunches are only supposed to have 25 plants in them they don't have 30 in them 
So we didn't get quite to the end on these first two rows, but it'll be all right. We'll have plenty of sweet taters. Now my Puerto Rico's here, had a few extra plants in that bunch, so we were able to make it to the end of the row. Now what we need to do is turn on our tripod sprinkler here and soak these puppies in good. Now they're gonna look a little wilty and a little pitiful the first few days after planting. That's just part of it. And you gotta baby them a little bit for those first few days until they get some roots in the soil. Then they take off and they're pretty drought tolerant. So we're gonna water them for a few hours today, probably a few hours tomorrow, a few hours the next day. And after about three good days of water, they should take off and they should be pretty independent after that. Now there's several reasons I don't use drip tape on sweet taters. One, they don't really need a whole lot of water. Like I said, we can give them a splash with the overhead every now and then, but it's not something we gotta be watering every other day, even in the heat of summer. Two, that drip tape right down there where the sweet taters sit, kind of the same principle as why I don't use drip tape on regular taters. It keeps the soil too wet right there in my opinion and you can have some rotting. I've had it happen before. And then thirdly, when you've got drip tape down there and you've got all those vines pinned to the ground and you go to dig them, that drip tape gets in the way and is an absolute booger to deal with when you're digging sweet taters. So that's why I don't like to use drip tape on them. You can use drip tape on them. Personally, just not my thing. So once these babies start growing, they'll start producing a good amount of foliage there and they'll kind of fill the gaps along the row there. We end up kind of a full looking row of plants. When that happens, that's when we'll come in here and heal them and side dress them a little bit. That'll take, I don't know, several weeks to a month. So not nothing we need to do right now, but something we will have to do in the future. All right, so sweet taters are done. And don't forget, if you haven't gotten your sweet potato slips yet, most of these places will stop shipping soon. So go to Steel Plant Company. You can get some of these same varieties we planted today or some different varieties. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a link in the description below. If you're watching on Facebook, you can go to our website on our affiliates page and find a link right there. And now over here in our indeterminate tomato patch, I've since removed some of those plants that were looking pretty pitiful. I showed you a few videos ago. We had some good thoughtful comments on that video. People trying to figure out what could have happened to those plants. I wanna go through a few of those theories. And then I think I got a few that are looking prime ripe. And so we're gonna give them a try. So we see a few gaps in here now where we removed some of those weak links and most of the plants that are in here have started doing better. We haven't lost any more besides those ones I showed you that looked bad the other day. The temperatures have cooled off a little bit around here. We got some rain and that seemed to help. So when we pulled up those few plants that were struggling or that had died, we wanted to check for a few things that you guys had suggested that might could have been the problem. So the first thing we looked for was root knots, which would have told us that nematodes were doing the damage. I didn't see any root knots there, so I don't think it's nematodes. I usually don't have a whole lot of nematode issues around here, especially since we started doing that mustard cover crop plan several years ago. We rotate things around, we cover crop heavily, and parasitic nematodes usually aren't an issue for us as a result of that program. Now several of you mentioned to check if the stem was hollow right there near the soil line. And the stems were nice and healthy. I even cut them open. Everything looked pretty normal there. So I don't think that was the problem. Now several of you mentioned spray drift, which is certainly something to worry about. Now around here, they don't spray the roadsides, at least on our road, they don't. The cotton and peanuts around here do get sprayed, but I think they just started spraying those. I seen a sprayer, a tractor sprayer, yesterday out here and that was after we started seeing all those problems haven't seen any airplane sprayers this year and if it was damage to spray drift it would have likely wiped them all out not just a random one here and there and then you've got the issue of mulch or hay contamination and if i was using hay that would certainly be something to worry about but this is pine straw this comes out of the woods as far as i know they're not spraying underneath all these pine trees with anything. And this batch of pine straw is the same batch that we're using on our peppers, a lot of other stuff in the garden, our figs, and we haven't seen any issues anywhere else. 
Now, one of the more plausible suggestions I heard was what if your drip tape emitters are clogged and those plants just aren't getting enough water? I thought, well, I've been using drip tape a long time, burying it, all kind of stuff. I've never seen an emitter get clogged, but that's worth checking. So I pulled back the straw here, pulled back the soil from one of these plants that we removed to check that. And if you look right there, we can see that drip tape's putting out plenty of water. And as I told you last time, I'm not really seeing the typical signs of disease. I know what spotted wilt virus looks like. I know what septoria leaf spot looks like. I know what mosaic virus looks like. And I'm not seeing any of those signs on the leaves. We are seeing the leaves curling, which tells us they're stressed from something. But the disease, if it is a disease, it's not very identifiable. So I'm going to chalk it up to the fact that I don't think these type of tomatoes, these heirloom indeterminate types, like 95 degree weather. I kind of knew that already, but I think that's what it was because we've seen it get a little bit better as the temperatures have cooled off a little bit this week. Now, if we go back up to 95, we may start losing some more again. It's just part of it. If we had some shade cloth, I'm sure that would definitely help. May try to implement something like that in future years. I don't really have a system set up for that right now. But that's definitely something to consider in the future. So for right now, we're just going to enjoy what we've got here. I'm going to push them pretty hard with some of that Agar Thrive fruit and flower. That should help a little bit. And we're just going to get what we can get. And we've got a few we need to get right here today. Here's some pretty German Johnson maters that are ready. They're not very big. They usually get a good bit bigger than this. And some of these at the bottom look a little rough. But some of them look pretty good. Nothing wrong with that one right there. Not really a, a big sandwich tomato, but it's the perfect ripeness. And it's mighty pretty. Go ahead and grab some of these other ones here. Look a little skin up. And then we've got this one right here. This is that rose variety. And I don't really know what the final color on these is supposed to be there but the skins are starting to feel kind of soft there so i think i'm going to go ahead and grab this one before something happens to it and we'll let it sit on the counter and see what color it ripens to i can get it off of here there we go pull the stem out a little bit we'll see what that one ends up looking like and then the one i'm most excited about today is this paul robeson tomato here I've never tried one of these, but I've heard really, really good things about them. And that looks like it is at peak ripeness there. Let's see if we can get it off of there. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? That looks like that's going to be quite tasty. Now, I also snagged this one right here yesterday off one of those plants I pulled. The plant looked terrible, but it did have one nice-looking Kellogg's breakfast mater at the bottom. Not as big as they usually get, but it sure is pretty Got a little blemish on the side there, so we probably need to eat this one fast. This one here is the one that's really got my eye today. What you say we cut it open and see what it looks like. Oh man, look at the color on that thing there. Ooh, smells like a mater. Looks like a mater. That's going to be good. Y'all bear with me for a second. I'll be right back. Well, I ended up having to use two of them maters to make a proper mater sandwich. So we got Paul Robeson on the bottom here, Kellogg's breakfast on the top. Got to have the Duke's mayonnaise in there. My preferred seasoning of choice is some Lowry's garlic salt and some fresh cracked black pepper. First mater sandwich of the year. It's time to dig in. It don't fall apart on me. Mm. Don't get much better than that, folks. And as I like to say with a lot of things, we ain't gonna set any records, but we ain't gonna get skunked either. So we may lose some plants in that indeterminate tomato plot, but we're gonna get a few of them beautiful, tasty maters off of it to make it worth the time. So I'm gonna enjoy the rest of my sandwich here and the rest of my day, and I hope you enjoy the rest of yours as well. Don't forget to get your sweet potato slips if you haven't got them already. And if you planted sweet potatoes or you're planning on planting sweet potatoes, let me know which varieties you're growing. Don't forget to check out our affiliate links below if you're watching on YouTube, and go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com. We've got recipes, recommended products, our blog, all kind of good stuff over there. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh,
will mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life 